Today, I'm going to talk about what triggers the narcissist's anger. Hi, I'm Nanette. Welcome back to Narcissism Exposed. So first, let me share with you what anger is in a healthy, balanced person. Anger is actually judgment for something that has been done. So you might call it righteous anger or right on anger. So it could be that somebody crossed your boundaries or someone stole from you or someone hurt someone you love. So you, we're talking about how your anger has been a result of your judging what somebody has done to you as being either wrong or evil. And that is how your anger has been stimulated. And in that anger, you seek to confront the person who wronged you or expose that person or reprimand that person or seek restitution. But through it all, you're in self-awareness and self-control. The narcissist's anger is basically a cover. It's not what it is, what I just described in a healthy, balanced person. It's a cover for feeling threatened. And what are they feeling threatened about? They're feeling threatened because inside, basically something you said or did, inside stimulated in them feelings of shame, self-criticism, self-judgment. And the result of the anger in the narcissist is rage, anger, aggression. That conjures all of those feelings up and so instead of any self-awareness or self-regulating or self-control, they want to deflect that onto you and lash out at you. You see, inwardly, the narcissist is constantly battling with the shame that they feel because they have no self-worth, no self-achievements. They have stolen so many things from so many people that they don't even know who they are anymore. So when you challenge them in any way, and I'm gonna share statements with you that you and I have made in the past with a narcissist, uh, and I'm sure there's many, many more. I'm just gonna go over eight statements, popular statements that the empath, the good person, the Christian makes with a narcissistic partner or a parent or a sibling or a friend or frenemy, I call them, or a coworker, where you bring that up and it just ignites the anger in that narcissist and they can't handle their own shame. And so to cover up how they feel within themselves, they're threatened, they're going to attack you verbally and hopefully not physically, but they that's their rage and aggression. You see, the narcissist always has to feel like he or she is in control, that they're the special one in the group. They always feel entitled. Uh, they feel like they're the superior one, that they know best, that everyone should look up to them, that they're the most popular in the group, and that they're never, ever wrong. And the point of my bringing up these statements that will trigger the anger in a narcissist is so that you are aware of what is going on in the back end in the narcissist's mind and that it is not you. It is not your fault. You are not to blame for the anger of the narcissist. No, they are the ones who are accountable for their anger, but they never will do that, will they? They'll never be accountable for their actions, for their anger. So I'm pointing these out and this is going to jog your memory. And if there's a check mark, go ahead and make a mental check mark to any one of these. And if you have any others that you can recall with your time with the narcissist, jot those down in the comment section as well. The first one is one that I used many, many times. And it's this, you know, we've already talked about this and I would get a multiple of responses. At one time I would get, oh, did you say that? And another time I would get, oh, I never agreed to that. Or another time they go, gee, I don't remember you ever saying that. And the times that you are referring to where we already talked about that is where most likely you have gotten this, the bobblehead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
So with the bobblehead, you must know that there's no real acknowledgement, there's no real commitment, and there's no real change in the narcissist. It's just the bobblehead. The second very popular statement that you may make to the narcissist is, why can't you just see my perspective? Well, you pretty much know the answer to that. It's because the narcissist, it lacks humility and the narcissist has no empathy for you. They could care less about your perspective, your opinion, or how you feel about something. And of course, admitting that your perspective just might be right above their perspective would definitely weaken their stance as being the superior one in their heads, right? And so that's why you will very rarely get the narcissist to see your perspective. The third very common statement is, why do you always feel like you need to be in control? Why do you always feel like you need to be in charge? Well, the reason is, is because the narcissist assigned him or herself that position of being in charge. And anytime you ask that question, the narcissist feels threatened. The narcissist feels like, I don't want to be put in the inferior position. That's where I put you. I put you in the inferior position. So of course I always have to be in charge. And when you do bring this up, they actually feel offended. They actually will feel insulted. Like how dare you bring up that, of course you know I have to be in charge and in control. Have any of you ever experienced that? A fourth statement is when you bring up, well, you know, the last time we did things your way, it failed. You'll immediately trigger the, the anger of the narcissist. They'll do some blame shifting. They'll start pointing fingers at you. They'll dredge up the past and say, well, what about you, 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 and you? And they'll never directly handle the situation that's at hand. A fifth common statement that you might use with the narcissist is, you know, why can't I just get through to you? You'll get the narcissist who turns around and says, well, why can't I get through to you? You're the illogical one. You're the stupid one. You're the ignorant one. I have to think for the both of us. Get through to me? Huh? Yeah, so you, you get what I'm saying. Or again, they don't want to take the inferior position at all. They're the ones who, again, are in charge. So no one needs to get through to them. Their logic is perfect. The way they do things is perfect. And again, they, they really uh, push hard to maintain that superior mental attitude that they have to make you, everyone in the room, feel like they're beneath them. A sixth statement is, you may say to the narcissist, do you really think I'm that stupid? And they'll turn around and think, well, yeah, I do think you're that stupid. Why? It's because you threatened their own sense of self-importance and self-given authority. That's why. So they're, they feel threatened and you provoke that anger in them. Anytime they feel challenged on any, the simplest things, they're going to get into a rage. And this seventh statement was a favorite of mine. And I would say, do you realize that what you're doing is damaging this relationship? And the response was the same time and time again. I'm not doing anything to damage this relationship. Last month you did this or this other month you did that. And it's usually some kind of fake incident, some fabricated incident that they're struggling to try to pull out of thin air to blame you with and say, no, no, you see, you're damaging, you're damaging the rela relationship. So you see that it's a really warped thing. Even just sharing this with you, I know a lot of you, this is resonating with you, that this has happened to you, plus many more other, you know, triggers for the narcissist. But their reasoning, their rationale, it's like a five-year-old who's going, when you go, no, you did something wrong, and they'll turn around, no, you did something wrong, you did it. Uh, okay, who broke the vase here? Uh, she did it, she did it, she did it. it it's, it's so juvenile after a while, and you see, I want you to start seeing the, these patterns where 
things just don't get resolved. You just get backed into a corner time and time again, backed against the wall. And it gets so sometimes fierce and the rage gets so aggressive that, that anymore, you don't even want to bring anything up because you're thinking, I don't want to have to deal with that again. Uh, I'll just overlook it or I'll just, you know, sweep it under the rug. No, don't do that. What that's doing is chiseling away at your boundaries and I don't want you ever to feel threatened by the narcissist in your life. And the eighth statement that you may have made to the narcissist is, you know, I just can't keep doing this with you. And as soon as you say that, the narcissist feels extremely threatened. Why? Because one, you are threatening his or her supply, right? And number two, they're the ones that want to, uh, they're going to break up with you so that they look like you're the loser and that they stay on top with their image. And that's why they go, no, uh, I'm going to break off with you. No, I can't take enough any more of this with you. And it's, it's always a tit for tat, tit for tat. It's never a mature discussion, a communication, consideration, love and kindness, which you would think that an intimate relationship would be, right? But it's not. It's like a small child trying to fight at you and using small child techniques. You know, and in their small mind, they think if they discard you first before you discard them, that it makes them look like the superior one, like they're on top. Either way, Praise God, you don't have to deal with that destructive behavior anymore. Detach from it, move away from it. That kind of anger is evil anger. It's a threatening anger. It's a rageful and aggressive anger. And if you push too much to take your stand with your boundaries, you need to be careful because these narcissists that are demonically driven and hear those voices in their ear, this can get dangerous for you. I want you to know that. So these things that I bring up as, as there's like this side to it that's so absurd, but the danger element can be very real. And the thing to do is to detach. Do not stay in the presence of evil. You cannot rationalize with evil. You cannot talk about equal rights with evil. You can't talk about considering how you feel with evil. It, it's just not going to happen. And the more you keep trying, the more you get put in that hamster wheel. Come on, run, 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 faster, faster enough is enough. I want you to get to that place where you say enough is enough. I deserve better. You as the empath, you as the good person, you as the Christian, you deserve someone just like you. You deserve the best. You deserve God's best. And I'm going to cover a couple of scriptures here that talk about this righteous anger, the anger that is a result of judgment for what somebody has done. And the account that I want to read about is in Matthew chapter 3. It starts with verse 1. And it's talking about the Sabbath day and how Jesus Christ is walking into the synagogue. And then he meets somebody with a withered hand. And here's how this goes. Once again, Jesus entered the synagogue and a man with a withered hand was there. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. Why do you think they watched him closely? To, because they were amazed at how wonderful Jesus Christ was, right? No, they were watching him closely so that they could condemn him in some way. They were trying to find some way to cause blame to him. And if he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. I love how bold Jesus Christ was during the gospel times when you read the accounts because he knew who he was and that God was his heavenly father and he was going to walk by the revelation of his father in this situation despite what the circumstances were. And Jesus said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they were silent 
And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored as whole as the other. I love that. So Jesus Christ was doing the Father's will, even though it was on the Sabbath and the, the others that were watching him were looking to put blame on him, to criticize him, to catch him in the act, because on the Sabbath we weren't so, supposed to do any type of civil work. And so here he was saying, well, is it better to just do evil on the Sabbath or to do good, to save life or to kill? And so Jesus Christ made the godly choice. And yeah, he was angered by what they were doing, the hardness of the heart. Think about the hardness of the narcissist's heart. Think about all the times you may have cried and just begged that person to see how your feelings are being hurt, how they're causing you pain and suffering, and they could care less. And in fact, you caught a glimpse of them actually gleaming over your pain. Yeah, that's right. Hardness of the heart. There's a specific verse in Ephesians chapter 4, and it's in verses 26 and 27, and it talks about how... The Christian believer actually has a right to righteous anger. That's right. And when is that a righteous anger? That righteous anger is when someone is crossing the word of God in your life. That's right. And it says, be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun set upon your anger. In other words, you, you can have righteous anger where you need to confront someone, reprimand someone, expose someone, but don't let it get to the place where it becomes rage or outrage and you go to bed where this is just, uh, you're fuming. No, you don't want it to get to that place, but you can have a righteous anger or a right on anger but then the next verse tells you, neither give place to the devil. And what that's referring to is, again, if you go to bed with that heavy heart where you're not peaceful anymore, the whole thing is this, you can be have righteous anger and still be at peace. Did you know that? That's right, you can. And it's when you allow that anger to turn to this boiling point where your peace is gone then that's giving place to the devil because once that happens, you know, then the devil starts toying with you and playing with you and messing with you. So you always want to make sure that any anger you have is in balanced, right? It's a, a godly anger and it always aligns up with the word of God. So again, I don't want you to tolerate the bad behavior of the narcissist. I don't want you be, to be afraid to speak your truth, to speak your mind, to stand on your boundaries and stand for your boundaries, and most especially to stand for the word of God in your life. That's right. And the one thing I do know about the narcissist is that he or she is always going to want to challenge the word of God in your life, but don't you let them. No, you stand firm. Don't tolerate that anger, that rage, that aggression, which is only there to cover up how threatened they feel for who they really know they are, how empty they are and full of shame. You, the empath, the good person, the Christian, the righteous one, that's right. You have that right to be angry at somebody who's crossing your boundaries, who is crossing the word of God in your life and don't stand for it and detach from it don't be around it and still maintain your peace go to god and you know what god is who heals your heart you can pray for that narcissist from afar keep your distance but you keep going on your path of truth and righteousness and don't let anything about the narcissist hold you back anymore now that you're learning so much of the mo of the narcissist and also the triggers within yourself where you feel like you're trying to help them but secretly they know they don't want help but they're just using you that's called the cycle of abuse for a reason it's a cycle it goes around and around like a washing machine goes around and around and around and it doesn't stop until you make it stop until you 
decide to detach and walk away. That's right. So I want you to consider this, the verses that I shared with you and also leave your comments down below. Share with me some statements you used to use that would trigger the narcissist and also always leave your Bible verses. I love the verses that you are all leaving and any prayer requests, leave those down below as well. And if you found this video helpful, do hit the like button and don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already subscribed and be sure to hit the notification bell so you'll be notified the next time I put out a video. And until next time, walk in peace and be blessed in your hearts.